We come now to a major development in the scientific psychology, which belongs really in the first half of the 20th century, and that is scientific behaviorism. And with behaviorism, the goals of scientific psychology, um, as originally expressed, have changed somewhat. So we noted that the emerging science of psychology had interests that sort of diverged, went in two directions. One was to understand the subjective nature of experience, to uh, ask about uh, perception, memory, what's going on in people's so-called minds. And the other was to understand behavior. Why do people behave in certain ways? How is behavior modified or changed? Behaviorism only follows one of these routes. So the experiential side is left out. Um, the emerging science of psychology had encountered difficulty in um, appearing to be truly scientific precisely because of the subjective element that necessarily attends such inquiry and behaviorism adopted a cut the Gordian knot approach to this by simply outlawing appeal to unobservable mental states so the whole business of psychophysics where you ask people what they hear for example uh, goes out the door here and introspection where you ask people to um, comment on mental processes, that is absolutely outlawed as well. So it was an attempt to be very rigorous and scientific. And this is strongly empirical in that the elements in the theory must refer to observable entities. Now, there are many kinds of behaviorism. It was, by and large, a movement in Anglo-American psychology, although there were examples elsewhere as well. The most favorite, famous of, this, of the behaviors is probably Skinner, although he may fight with Pavlov for that honor. So where we expressed our somewhat uncertain topic in cognitive science as being the many ways we can ask questions about the relationships between minds, brains, and behavior, in the behaviorist approach, we're going to rule out those complicated minds, those pesky things that we can't see or observe altogether, and focus on behavior. So the questions that they had were, how are patterns of behavior acquired? Where do they come from? How are they modified? How are they lost? And most forms of behaviorism made one term central, which is the, ter the idea of conditioning. Conditioning is that which gives rise to new behaviors or to modifying behavior. Now, conditioning can occur through explicit intervention, through the creation of an experimental situation, through um, various forms of intervention, or perhaps it lies in the environment in which a given subject lives. So this strong focus on conditioning meant that most behaviorists were happy to work with animal models. It's very easy to do experiments on animals and modify their behavior and completely control the conditions. It's not so easy to do that with humans, but that is a very restricted lens indeed, given the kind of goals with which scientific psychology had set out. Skinner's approach is quite unique. Um, Skinner studied and employed a particular form of conditioning known as operant conditioning. There are other forms of conditioning, which we will meet. The basic idea underlying operant conditioning is very simple. It's a carrot and stick approach. Behavior is assumed as modified as a result of its consequences. If something good happens when you act in one way, then you're more likely to do it again. Conversely, if you burn yourself as a young kid on a hot stove, you will avoid doing that again. Now, Skinner, in this example we're going to look at, worked primarily with pigeons. And these pigeons were kept isolated in boxes, small boxes, known as Skinner boxes. Now, that's a pathological condition, of course. Pigeons are not normally birds that live in boxes. Furthermore, they were kept at two-thirds of their normal weight. So these are very hungry birds indeed, and for them, food is going to be a very significant motivating factor. Um, in one experiment, food was delivered at unpredictable times. So pigeons couldn't predict when food was going to arrive. And yet these pigeons developed strange stereotypical behaviors, odd behaviors, under these conditions. Um, and to some extent, it looked as if the pigeons were indulging in these behaviors in order to cause food to appear. We'll come back to that interpretation in just a minute. Let's have a look at the behaviors. So, for example, one bird was conditioned to turn counterclockwise around the cage making a couple of turns between reinforcements, and another kept 
thrusting its head into one of the upper corners of the cage. Others developed tossing responses or pendulum motions. These are stereotypical behaviours you might not be surprised to see in an institutionalised animal in the zoo, for example. So why did the birds develop these behaviours? Well, Skinner was more aware than most that behaviours occur in specific contexts and the behaviour is not independent of the context in which it occurs. He had, of course, created this artificial context, the Skinner boxes, the isolation, the starving conditions and the randomised food delivery. Those are experimental constructs. Um, and the resulting behaviour arises from pigeon plus context. So this spreads the load in a way for um, understanding behaviours between the subject and its world. And this insight is worth hanging on to. Notice what happens if we don't do that, if we assume that the pigeon is responsible entirely for its behaviour, then what we've done is we've turned these pigeons into little reasoning Christians. That is, we can understand this in some sense if the pigeon were starving and then sometimes food appears and the pigeon thinks, ah, what made that food appear? And the pigeon thinks, what was I doing before that? And the pigeon repeats that. And like any good gambler in Las Vegas, it doesn't notice when, it, when, when this attempt fails. But every time the pigeon reproduces the behavior and food arrives, we get that winner's rush and the pigeon becomes reinforced in its behavior. That's a really poor explanation of what was going on. I hope you can see we're talking about pigeons, which are little birds, as if they were reasoning Western Europeans. Skinner didn't do that. He understood that the behavior is should be understood as a resultant of a particular kind of animal under very specific conditions. This way of modifying behavior is very, very successful in some areas. Uh, animal trainers in circuses and shows have long used this kind of operant conditioning in order to modify and generate specifically desired forms of behavior. With animals, it, has, it turns out the reward is very uh, effective, but the punishment is not so effective. Um, behavior shaping has a kind of a strange and troubling ring to it, and it should do, because we'll see later that much of behavioral science is still with us, not necessarily in the psychology departments. But for now, let's look at another behaviorist, another one you may have heard of, Ivan Pavlov. Pavlov had worked with a different notion of conditioning, which is known as classical conditioning. And in this, a technical vocabulary was developed in which some central terms are the notion of stimulus and response. You've all heard these terms, they've entered our language, this is where they come from, and we will have to give good a lot of thought as to what they mean. The idea was that one could um, invoke involuntary learning through pairing of sp particular stimuli and response. And the experiment you're probably all familiar with, with salivating dogs, works like this. We have a dog, and when the dog is hungry, the dog salivates in anticipation of food. If you put a plate of food in front of it, saliva starts being produced. That makes sense when you consider the dog as an animal that must feed. If you play a tuning fork or ring a bell at the dog, nothing much happens. The bell doesn't mean anything to the dog. But if you undergo a training regime where the bell and the food placement are linked, so that every time the food arrives, the bell is rung as well. Over time, the bell seems to acquire some of the meaningful properties of the food. And the crucial experiment at the end is done when after a period of conditioning like this, the bell is rung in the absence of food and the dog salivates. And this is taken as evidence that the meaning of the food has somehow been transferred into the bell an act of symbolization, which, if this were an appropriate interpretation, would be very, very meaningful indeed. In fact, Pavlov was given the Nobel Prize for this work. There's Mr. Pavlov indeed with one of his dogs, and you can see the slightly antique look of his lab. Now, I invite you to be very, very skeptical of any account of behavior as being produced by stimuli, um, 
and generating a response. Anytime the words stimulus and response are paired, I would like you to be critical. I'm going to play you a short video in which the cybernetician Heinz von Furster chats with Umberto Maturana about a replication of Pavlov's work done by a guy called Konorsky. Fascinating experiments to establish the intelligence of, of animals. I think the most beautiful thing is the Pavlov studies to getting the conditioned reflexing going. Yeah? He had a dog, putting a dog on a, a table, and there was an assistant in a white coat. The assistant showed the dog a piece of meat, and when the dog looked at it, of course, he was looking forward, he salivated a lot of saliva was coming up, and then the assistant rang a bell. Okay, very good, they do this ten times, and then the assistant enters the room, rings the bell, and the dog salivates. This was for dog, the proof, uh, conditional reflex. The dog can transfer the ringing of the bell to, sh to the meat without being even shown the meat. An uh, act of symbolization. Mm -hmm. And of course he got for that the Nobel Prize. A Polish experimental psychologist said Pavlov wrote his experimental conditions so well in his lab books that I can repeat his experiments exactly as he carried it out. So Konoski did exactly the experiment, uh, the lab assistant with the same white coat, the dog at the, at the, ch at the table next to the window, a, a bell standing next to the table, assistant going with the meat, with the bell, meat and bell, and now comes the experimentum crucis, where no meat is shown, but only the bell is around. Konorski took the clapper out of the bell without the assistant knowing that. So the assistant goes in, grabs the bell, no sound is coming out, but the dog salivates. So Konorski concluded the ringing of the bell was a stimulus for Pavlov, <laughs> for the dog. Not for the dog. But unfortunately, he didn't get the Nobel Prize for that. No. But it was a so. I hope you can see von Furster's point here. The understanding that the bell was acting as a stimulus was the scientist's interpretation. Consider the dog's point of view. There is a great deal going on all the times. So there's a certain predictability to events, the surroundings, the assistant. There's lots and lots of clues as to what's going on. And so the salivation in the absence of the sound of the bell shows nothing more than that something was happening, which is very similar to what had happened on previous days. So on the interpretation of the bell as being the unique element here, which causes the salivation, that belongs to Pavlov, and the dog was innocent of it. So anytime we hear these words, stimulus and response, we need to think very, very carefully. They are dangerous words. Um, and the, the question there is, what does if you frame an explanation like that, what are you assuming about the nervous system? You're assuming that it's kind of passive. You're assuming that the organism is kind of passive and has been played by the stimulus. So you can see some of the problems that arise with these behaviorist accounts. They provide a very, very mechanistic view of the human spirit, which was completely at odds with much of the original motivation for developing the science of psychology. There was no attempt to approach, understand, elucidate, or characterize the richness of our subjective experience of our mental lives. The theory of learning was very, very impoverished. It works fine for animals, but as we'll see later, there were severe limitations with this approach when you move up to humans. And of course, one of the principal goals of psychology has got lost. Now, not all behaviorists shared one worldview. There were great differences among them. Um, Skinner was very, very aware of the importance of context in which behavior happened, that, and an awareness that Pavlov is wo woefully unaware of here. Uh, John Watson is one, another one we, we haven't discussed, but he and Pavlov largely ignored context. And if you ignore the role of context, that means you're attributing an awful lot to the presumed activity of the brain of a subject. This is not always a good thing.